as long as literary scholarship denies the existence of a Shakespeare authorship controversy, it will not be able to recognize autobiographical aspects of the true Shakespeare, up to now not accepted as one of the pseudonyms of the poet Genius Marlowe in his plays, such as Coriolanus. The protagonist Coriolanus, the author himself, does not get over this insult and wants to take revenge on his country. Torn between his own individual and complementary social values, represented by his mother, Coriolanus concludes that the outer victory can not be his way. This motivational background contains not only all the ingredients for the actual text, but also for a theater allegory or theater parable of the true Shakespeare's life. The poet obviously used Plutarch's mythical figure Neus Keys Martius Coriolanus, a non-historical Roman figure, whose pride and stubbornness led to clashes with the plebeians. Banished from his home, he led a war against his own hometown, which he broke off only at the request of his mother. Martius Coriolanus son expresses, who deserves greatness, deserves your hate. This type of a complementary motto belongs to the most dominating motifs of Marlowe and of his plays, whoever can be called a genius, highly gifted, of outstanding talent, always runs the risk, to be regarded as haughty, arrogant and proud, that is, whoever deserves greatness, comes into conflict with the majority. Richard Baines accused Marlowe a few days before his supposed killing, to have said, that the first beginning of religion was only to keep men in awe. Also in the first scene of the first act of Coriolanus a similar motif comes up, but in a positive reversal, we hear, 
and cry against the noble senate, who under the gods keep you in awe, which else would feed on one another. What's their seeking? In Coriolanus, the poet puts his own life problematic as a parable down, it is the indissoluble conflict between individual greatness and mediocrity of a society, between individual and mass. Similar in Goethe's play, Torcato Tasso. Accordingly, the description of the character of Coriolanus describes a psychological self-portrait of the poet. For the progress of the play itself and especially for a war officer alone, Coriolanus would make little sense. The quite extraordinary character traits of his genius, far ahead of his time, are recognizable and provable for Marlowe, and fit quite well with his assumed personality. Nothing similar is recognizable, known, or imaginable for the Stratfordman, let alone for the Earl of Oxford. In this context, Gabriel Harvey's contemporary description of Marlowe's extraordinary character and personality traits, is the most significant and apt. Harvey wrote the lines on the occasion of the reported event of Marlowe's supposed demise, the most important event of the year 1593, for Harvey. He suspected at that time that the raging plague had killed Marlowe. Consider Harvey's key characteristics or contextual features of Marlowe, in September 1593. What may be the reason, that in 1593 coeval Marlowe was so infinitely superior to Shakespeare, who was literally unknown at that time? This description of Coriolanus merits, for his country, obviously corresponds to a covert reference of a preserved letter from members of the Privy Council, including William Cecil, to the Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, in 1587, expressing Marlowe's merits, and that his master degree should not be denied. Marlowe had received a six year scholarship to study at the University of Cambridge. How else should one interpret parallels to the following contemporary passage of a remarkable historical letter? Whereas it was reported, that Christopher Morley was determined, to have gone beyond the seas to Reims, and there to remain, their lordships thought good, to certify, that he had no such intent, but that in all his actions, he had behaved himself orderly and discreetly, whereby he had done Her Majesty good service, and deserved, to be rewarded for his faithful dealing, their lordships request, that the rumour thereof should be allayed by all possible means, and that he should be furthered in the degree he was to take up this next commencement because it was not Her Majesty's pleasure, that anyone employed, as he has been in matters, touching the benefit of his country, should be defamed by those, that are ignorant in the affairs, he went about.
the allusions to Coriolanus' necessary concealment clearly point to the situation of Marlowe, and cannot have come about accidentally. When Coriolanus in Act 1 Scene 9, is downplaying his own actions I have done, as you have done, that's what I can, that's for my country, Cominius tries, to convince him, that his merits should not be hidden, that is, buried. You shall not be the grave of your deserving. The city must recognize its advantage in it. It were a concealment, worse than a theft, no less than a traducement, to hide your doings, and to silence that, which, to the spire and top of praises vouched, would seem, but modest. The story of a Roman general does not quite fit in with this obvious picture of someone living in secret, whose works are kept secret. Only, if you recognize the fate of Marlowe behind the story, the analogies become understandable. The psychological confrontation of the protagonist with his new name Coriolanus, in the end, only that name remains, corresponds to the almost unmistakable analogy with Marlowe's new identity and his name changes. From C.M. to Coriolanus or Shakespeare and others. Herald in Act II Scene 1 proclaims, that C.M. is given a new name. He has one, that means, added, with fame, a new name to Martius Cagius, these in honor follows, Coriolanus. All that seems authentic and represents an analogy to the situation of Marlowe, who may have resisted the compulsion, to give up his identity, until he came up with the idea of a new name. Till he forged himself a name over the fire. One directly associates the forged spear. The intensive dealing of Coriolanus with the accusation of his pride and haughtiness runs like a red thread through the tragedy. Terms like pride, proudly, proud, insolence, disdain, etc., etc., appear disproportionately frequent. Coriolanus' internal defense against contemporaries is not only evident in the aforementioned witness of Gabriel Harvey, the haughty man extol his hideous thoughts, and gloriously insults upon poor souls, but also in The Theatre of God's Judgments by Thomas Beard. By practice a playmaker and a poet of scurrility, who by giving too large a swing to his own wit, representing the conventional defense against a genius, who is depicted in the conflict of Coriolanus. Coriolanus, as a poet, was clearly aware, that his outstanding talent brought with it the danger, to be perceived as proud and haughty by others. Note a short excerpt of the significance of this personal consternation by single textual statements from different scenes of Coriolanus. Marcus was a man ever this proud. Marcus, he's grown too proud to be so valiant. Sicinius, but I do wonder his insolence can be commended to. Brutus, he is poor in no one but faulty with everything, especially in pride. Brutus, and topping all others in boasting. Menenius, you blame Marcus for being proud. Menenius, yet you must say, Marcus is proud, who, in a cheap estimation, is worth all your predecessors since Deucalion. Sicinius, at some time when his soaring insolence will touch the people. Sicinius, he cannot temperately transport his honors. 
First officer, that's a good fellow, but he's vengeance proud and loves the common people. Volum near, the valiantness was mine, thou suckedst it from me but owe your pride yourself. Volum near, you are too absolute, but you can never be too noble. The themes of banishment and exile, the insult to the loss of life, come in so many dramatic expressions, in so many psychological shades, and run like a red thread through the play Coriolanus. That makes it unlikely, that the play would have emerged without an autobiographical background of the author himself. The words, banishment or exile appear in different forms thirty times, the statements of the first patrician that Coriolanus destroyed his own happiness. Or, when Coriolanus is reflecting his condemnation. Is reminiscent of Marlowe's ways, to metaphorically present himself, balancing precariously on the seesaw of his complementary wit. Coriolanus Marlowe's development, his ostracism, condemnation, banishment and exile, and all the consequences and bitterness they had for him, fill a considerable part of the tragedy. This mighty autobiographic parallelisms can by no means be purely coincidental. Does not it have to be considered a clear indication for the true Shakespeare, being Marlowe? On the surface, Coriolanus represents a belligerent helmet, but, on a deeper level, indicates an artistic hero, a playwright and a theatre person. Brutus describes in Act II, Scene 1 the powerful external impact of Coriolanus. He describes a poet and playwright, who successfully captivates his audience especially women. All tongues speak of him, and the bleared sights are spectacled to see him. The nurse is talking from him, from his plays. Or prattling nurse into a rapture, while she chats him. The kitchen maid climbs the benches, filled to the roof. Clambering the walls to eye him, stalls, bulks, windows, are smothered up, leads filled. With variable complexions, all agreeing, in earnest to see him. Spectators, never seen before, wanted to find space, do press among the popular throngs, and puff to winner a vulgar station. To see the kisses of Phoebus, in this confusion, of Phoebus burning kisses, such a poother. All this does not fit with a general. Phoebus, synonym of Apollo, stands for the god of the arts, especially poetry and music, by no means for a warrior. Here, undoubtedly a poet is described, who, like an alien god, is transformed into a man, and gives him grace. Was slyly crept into his humane powers, and gave him graceful posture. Art is usually about graceful postures, not about field men in the art of war. In Act II, Scene II, in which one learns about Coriolanus' youth, it becomes clear, that the author must have had the analogy of a poet, in mind. The deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. The man I speak of, cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. When he might act the woman in the scene, he proved best man in the field. Shakespeare seeks the correspondence of the brave warrior in the poet and stage, the analogy of the poet to Coriolanus can shine through unhindered.
In Lucretia, Marlowe assumes himself the role and figure of Tarquin and his downfall, using the metaphor of the desecration of Lucretia, the Queen Elizabeth. The inclusion of Tarquin in the monologue of Cominius, Act II, Scene II, in which he describes the advantages, and the career of the commander Coriolanus, fulfilled no doubt an intention. The poet signals a personal identity between Tarquin, Coriolanus, Shakespeare's figures, and himself. The man, I speak of, cannot be counterpoised in the world. At sixteen years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. Coriolanus is Tarquin's second self, both represent the encountering one's identities of Marlowe, Tarquin's self, he met and struck him on his knee, in that day's feats, when he was the actress, he proved best man in the field. In his early days, Marlowe played female roles at the theatre. In the play, Coriolanus' mother Volumer, reports about a drastic experience of her son during childhood. This authentic-looking account has, with great plausibility an autobiographical background, that is, superficially, of no importance to the play. Marlowe's mother gave her highly talented prodigal child in the custody of the aristocracy, as a page. This assumption is in line with the speculation of Blumenfeld and others, that Marlowe accompanied the entourage of the courtier and poet Philip Sidney as an eighth-year-old page on his three-year trip to Europe 1572 which included the stay in Paris during the St. Bartholomew's Night. The Massacre of Paris in 1572, and in Italy, 10 month 1574, and opened the possibility of bringing the prodigy Marlowe into contact with the ancient and Renaissance literature at a very early stage. She tells, when for a day of king's entreaties a mother should not sell him an hour from her beholding, I, consider, how honour would become such a person that it was no better than picture-like to hang by the wall, if renown made it not stir. She was pleased to let him seek danger, where he was like to find fame. So far, no one has given a plausible answer to the crucial question, why multiple text passages of Thomas North English translation from a French translation of James, Amiot of Plutarch's Coriolanus were taken, that is, plagiarized almost literally by Shakespeare in his play, Coriolanus.
if we assume, that in his sixteenth year of life the most eloquent true poet genius Shakespeare could read Amiot's French Plutarch translation fluently, one wonders, why he had to plagiarize Thomas North English translation, to write his play Coriolanus in 1607. If we further note, that North's translation was made by the printer Vortrollier, whose later successor Richard Field began there and married his wife after Vortrollier's death, using the same emblem the Anchor of Hope as on Shakespeare's first works Venus and Adonis 1593 and Lucretia 1594, wouldn't it not be more logic or plausible that the true Shakespeare was hiding behind the name Thomas North as an alias, in 1579, as well as behind the name George North, and thus readopted own ideas from early exercises. Thank you.